Welcome back to the Chamonix episode of The Debrief 2023. Chamonix, what a special World Cup. It's not just one of the oldest stops on the circuit, but this season it was extra special, even though that's maybe not what we would have expected going into the event. My name is Tyler Norton, and joining me as always is John Bergman, who writes for Climbing Magazine, Climbing Business Journal, and of course is the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing can't find the book image this time so people are just gonna have to google it rather than seeing it on screen um john what a special event and of course for this special uh world cup we're doing a special format where the headlines the winners and losers are suggested by you hopefully you saw the prompts on instagram or in the plastic weekly discord where we asked for your opinions and that's how we're going to be driving the conversation is your opinions whether they're smart or stupid funny or not references we understand or references that completely leave us baffled as to what you're talking about uh yeah we're just gonna roll with that and uh yeah i i are we gonna be okay with this or can we handle it do, do you think did somebody actually write in with sarcastic headlines that's an interesting idea for a show we there can... there was one headline where i was like i can't tell if you're joking or not because that's kind of silly but we can we can get to it that'll be a okay. funny uh loser topic but uh I like it. yeah i mean i think the place we have to start and the place where all of these users chimed in was of course the queen diva herself uh not <laughs> Not Big Frida. Sorry, I don't know why I'm why I'm stealing her uh, her name. Jane Kim, of course, back with the win, the the remarkable win that makes her the oldest woman ever to win a lead World Cup. Kairos Climber says, "Lead Queen Jane is back, baby." Kashka McKay says, "Mom spanks bunch of children." That's that's to me is my favorite headline from all of this. I think that's a pretty good description. Uncle Funkle says, "Jane Kim, the record breaker." Uh, Vladik Zoomer says, "Jane Kim, Lulu climbing Kim for a wild achievement that saved what would." have been an anticlimactic show uh let's let's just start there with jane kim we got more jane kim comments but let's start there uh was jane kim the headline from this comp absolutely she's the headline from this comp she might be the headline for this this season (laughs) Uh, this was this was such a cool moment such a cool uh i don't know that happened fast history uh it was just it was great and let's start from the beginning. Let's go way back because I think you and I were actually even texting about this maybe before the event started. So Mm -hmm. going into this event, we've seen an event here and there where one of the big names or one of the favorites or whatever you want to say is absent, right? Particularly Mm -hmm. in the Boulder season this year, think back to when like Yanya wouldn't be there and then everybody else is there, but then the next comp, maybe like Natalia wouldn't be there, but everybody else is there. Okay, so you got comps where maybe the the one favorite is not there. But then you got comps where two favorites aren't there. This competition went like... It's took it to even, a new level, man. <laughs> <laughs> an even new level where you had, statistically speaking, in both the men's and the women's division, you had the entire podium or a likely podium not there, absent, mm-hmm. right? Let's go through them. Let's start with the men's division because then we'll we'll talk about Giant Kim when we get to the women. Men's division, Adam Andra, absent, absent. Jakob Schubert, absent. Sasha Lehman, absent. Mm-hmm. That right there is a pretty yeah. stacked podium. That's a whole lot of medals right there, man. That's a whole lot of medals right there. And so, and then let's toggle over to the women's division. Of course, Yanya Garnbrett. Not there. I Mori, not there, right? The, we've been kind of waiting and wanting this mm-hmm. Yanya Garnbrett, I Mori showdown. Well, they're both not here. It's just okay. not happening, yeah. Brooke Rabatou, not there. Natalia Grossman, not there. Yeah. <laughs> right there. You take away that whole those four people, any any which way you could get them on a on a likely podium. So going back to what I was saying at the beginning, I went into this competition wondering, is something special enough going to happen that we kind of forget about all those absences or is there going to be a special moment that just nullifies all those glaring names that are not here and fortunately we got it we got what we were looking for albert oak on commentary made it all all better (laughs) friend of the show he's been on the show before shout out to albert uh i think we absolutely got it with giant kim in my opinion it sounds like in a lot of in the opinion of a lot of people writing these these headlines this wasn't just 
a, another win. This was a very special win. As you pointed out in your video that you made from your hotel room shortly after it happened that people can go watch on the on the Plastic Weekly channel, this was a historic win. And so I do think it nullified all those absences or it kind of transcend the fact that all those people were gone. I don't think any of that matters. And I don't think when, when time goes on, I don't think people are going to kind of hold that against Giants win or hold that against this competition. I think that the, the moment stands on its own. Yeah, I I wanted to add to your absence point because not just you know who is showing up to the competition, but who actually made it through to finals. The number of names that we lost in qualifiers, but especially semifinals. I know we're not talking about the men's round, but Ty Sehoma and Jesse Grouper going out in the semifinals round when they were like top three competitors at the start of this, uh, or at the, uh, from last season. Pardon me. Um, and then for the women's side, Laura Regora is just out um that's a, a comment that we'll talk about later from one of our viewers um uh who else natsuki tani not making it through like by the time we get to finals uh like who are we talking about it actually looks like almost an even field and your favorites have to be just jesse pills and cheyenne so and that is not nearly the level of of a final sphere that we're used to over the last couple of years so i i take your point absolutely and i think it's totally fair to to uh use that as a lens to view you know the 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 value of jane kim's win because some wins are worth more than others some wins are harder to get than others and that's totally relevant and i think in in the in the long term you can maybe look at those things and use them to compare you know some person's successes compared to another's but honestly the primary thing is counting the wins that is what most people pay attention to and particularly when we're talking about jane kim who gets a win when she's 34 becoming the oldest ever woman to uh, to win a lead uh, world cup just getting that record, regardless of the circumstances, that's a huge deal. You were relevant to the end and the rest of the field crumbled around you and you got that record that's been standing for like 28 years. 28 years, man. That's so wild. So yeah, it, it absolutely makes up for the low bar that I think a lot of us had set for this competition going into it. That, that record it, it, <laughs> that record predates, long predates competition, World Cups being viewable for the fans around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, like we're talking predates, Bob and predates most of the competitors in the scene right now. Like that, you know, that, that record was set before Yanya and all these damn before, uh, before Jesse, possibly I can't remember if she's a 96 or a 95 baby, but yeah, that, that, <laughs> that record, that record goes back, man. That's that, that was a long ass time ago. Yeah. I mean, you said Robin Herbisfield, she was one of the mm -hmm. people that, that held it up there with Lynn Hill. And, yeah. and I don't, think brooke was even born when robin no. was setting that record so no, neither um, of the kids yeah yeah and just to, just to talk more about giant's age here i want to throw something at you that i was thinking about and particularly thinking about when you posted that video uh from the hotel room so think about how wild and outlandish and just frankly like incomprehensible or unlikely it would sound if I would t to imagine if I would say like Daniel Woods winning a World <laughs> Cup in 2023 or let's let's go to the women's division because we're talking about giant think about like Eula Verm winning a World Cup in 2023 or Alex Puccio winning a World Cup in 2023 now I want to be clear I'm not meaning to diminish those competitors at all in in on the contrary, I say them all because they are all fantastic competitors who had fantastic competitive careers. But my point is, they are all bygone names from a bygone competition climbing mm -hmm. era. Obviously, they're all you know still crushers and and still relevant and all that in the climbing scene. But we're talking about World Cups here, bygone names from a bygone era, and yet. As unlikely and, and strange as it sounds to try to in, envision any of them standing atop a podium in 2023, Giant Kim is right there in that generation. That is her, that is her cohort. Daniel Woods is 33 years old. Giant Kim is 34 years old. Mm -hmm. Giant Kim is two years older than Eula Verm. And she's, I think, the same age as Alex Puccio. So... I think when you think about the names that are part of Giants generation and just how 
most of them, if not everyone but Jain, has moved on from the competition circuit and a number of years ago in a lot of cases. And yet Jain is still there crushing. It's just really special. And the kicker, the real the name that'll really get you, Jain Kim is only one year younger than Anna Storr. Oh, and so yeah. just think about how the Anna Storr era, as wonderful as it was, it seems like, you know, a ways back in history. Peak of, the peak of it was like 10 years ago almost, man. Exactly. And and yeah. a large part of that is because, of course, we've entered this new era that is kind of easily identifiable as the Yanya Garnbrett mm-hmm. era, right? Uh, that's what part of what makes Anna Storr's era seem so far back there. But yet, my point is... Chinese the same generation as on a store. I, I think I, 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 something I'm trying to come to grips with is like how new so much of the audience is in climbing. And I think that's just the nature for a sport that is growing so much in terms of participation, but also in terms of viewers. Um, there's a lot of turnover as well. So a lot of old viewers don't keep watching competitive climbing because it's kind of a painful thing to be of a fan of, as we're going to talk about kind of in the in the loser section, I guess. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people who probably outside of this comp wouldn't know who Jane Kim was or why she was important and so that means like some of the names you mentioned are like kind of maybe still on the tips of people's tongue because they're kind of like active outside and they get some of that like American media um, and so you see them kind of still around like Daniel Woods probably the best example of that but talk about the names that were you know uh, Jane's contemporaries talking about Mina Markovic of course another extraordinary climber who is probably forgotten for more than half of current viewers talk about Maya Vidmar another Slovenian superstar talk about I, I I don't know how far back we want to go but uh, uh like a lot of these names have kind of been lost to history if you're just a recent viewer and that's kind of what I'm trying to like get across to people is like Jane Kim is a time capsule of competitive climbing the different eras that she has climbed against you know in her earliest days the names that would have been forgotten at that point was she was she was bumping shoulders with the people that had been relevant in the early 2000s and and you know, she has covered so much ground in terms of her career. It's stunning. Um, and and so it is really it is really that special. And, and it is extraordinary to be to be this age and still winning gold. Medal. It's extraordinary at this age to be making finals. Right. And sh- she is probably the oldest competitor that was registered at the comp. Like, I-, I don't know that for sure, but I'm willing to bet if you look at the women's sign up for this, she was probably the oldest. So that makes her an exceptional outlier in the first place. And the fact that she's the oldest and she still makes semifinals and then still makes finals and then guarantees a medal and then wins it like it- that's not normal. Even though we all know she's a great climber, you still can't expect that. You you still have to celebrate like how unbelievable that is. So yeah, yeah I, don't, thinking, I don't really know what else I can say about Jane Kim at this point. <laughs> no, I, I love thinking about all these parallels and ways you can put it into context. I mean, another way to think about it, don't just think about other competitors from her era, but just anybody watching and listening, think about what you were doing in 2009 i think that was giant kim's first gold medal right in 2009 think back to what, uh yeah 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 that sounds think, right think back to what you were doing in 2009 and think about how different your life is now probably and and how you've evolved you know significantly over that uh, that amount of time and yet giants still there still crushing still mm-hmm. doing the same thing and just as good if not better than she was in in 2009 so uh yeah it was it was going back to it being really special too you know there's something extra special about the fact that she has said she's gone on record and it's been promoted on the live streams and stuff in the commentary about how the reason she is coming back is because she wants to be able to climb when her daughter is a part of her life and she wants her daughter to be able to grow up and kind of know that when her mom was was competing on the circuit her daughter was a part of that even though Mm -hmm. even if her daughter's too young to remember it now they'll have that special bond and they'll be able to of course talk about that forever how her daughter was was a part of this and it's just so cool that now it's a it's not just a part of giant kim you know being on the circuit it's a her daughter is part of giant wins a gold medal. You can't get any better than that. I just that that's what to me that's like the real feel good story is that bond between the two of them. I mean, I know it's kind of sappy, but 
let's get sappy. This is this is like <laughs> the, the, a great moment to just uh, revel in kind of the feels of all of it. That that is the whole point of sports is to like engage in human moments through these kind of like experiences right so yeah there should be emotional stuff john do you want to find uh like another headline from all these like crowd things while i read off the last couple uh uh jane kim comments yeah uh, let's see yeah jane kim shows us what longevity means uh quack says never too old to win gold jane kim and then talking about Jakob schubert from recently said there's no reason to retire uh, from comp climbing after 30 and that experience matters a lot in lead climbing which 100 percent it does yeah um that said you know when we're <laughs> when we're using like the ultimate legends of the sport like the most most decorated athletes in the history of climbing maybe they aren't a rule for all other climbers maybe we can acknowledge that they're the exception and that's not like oh yeah you can do it too because Jakob schubert and jane kim two like totally relatable and average climbers also, yeah, maybe we don't use them as a bar, but no, you're, t- you're still right. Um, yeah. So yeah, Jane Kim, I think is by far the headline, but I know there's a couple others that people mentioned. So what do you, uh, what do you yeah, got for me? So let's talk, let's kind of switch gears here because I think, uh, I, I think there are other potential headlines. I think in my opinion, probably Jane is the, the big story, but there's certainly plenty of other good ones here. Um, I know some people here chimed in with some speed related headlines. Mm-hmm. Should we switch gears and and talk about speed are you ready to uh, yeah i like i like the tears away from your the tears of happiness away from (laughs) your eyes uh talking about giant kim i'm ready i'm ready let's go to the shit show of that speed finals that absolutely like wild speed final that we experienced on uh on saturday um all right so grace crowley says double sub five race in the speed final yes (laughs) let's talk about this because if there's a great great headline uh there i mean if there's anything that people people watching this debrief are comp nerds and i say that with all affection that's what we all are and this was a cool like historic moment to know to kind of like nerd out and know that this moment will go down in history forever right it was in the i think it was maybe in the yeah i'm not sure like I, it is definitely a nerdy thing so i am kind of like it's cool that we witnessed it but i am kind of uncertain like yeah will people remember like aside from like grace crowley like uh, you know great speed climber it's something they're going to remember for sure but like is the average person actually going to take note of like <laughs> i remember the day and time that i witnessed the first <laughs> double sub five but anyway I, I think it was so it was in the half final it was adi Moliono and nurse Samsa, right? Yeah, Roger Rajadi or Samsa, yeah. That's right. And the two they were going at it and I think uh it was like a 5 uh, I'm sorry, a 497 and a 498 and something it, like so that. Yeah. Razor close and I think I've got to give credit to Matt Groom on commentary because he I said something he had like a great call but it's it's probably it kind of feels like salt being rubbed in the wound of the loser because Matt's call was imagine losing imagine like <laughs> running a sub five and losing yeah 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 totally <laughs> it's true uh but uh I, yeah that was a great moment great great headline there yeah I, 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 keep going keep going keep going yeah, yeah uh lulu climbing says speed favorites fail but make room for an amazing second tier speed finals show yeah we got to talk about like vedrique's Surprising let me let me exit. just clarify that comment because I think what they're trying to get across is is that like the second tier athletes, which like I kind of agree with, they're not like the ultimate superstars that made it through to finals. They provided like a top tier show. Like the for the most part, aside from maybe the women's like gold medal race, the rest of those races were bangers. And this comp only got better as as the finals went on. Like every bracket got better and better and better, and the races just got closer and closer. It was really something else. Especially, I think the men's big final, if I remember correctly, was won on the dyno, right? Like it was so neck and neck. And, yeah. And it was won at the, I mean, it, it can't get any more climactic than that. And then we all, we had, of course, I think in the the small final race, right? Um, I think uh, June. Um, yeah, they were they Yashikawa, were separate. They were separated by one thousandth of a second point in the zero zero one. <laughs> How is that possible? Dude? And then I think the women's small final also was extremely close as well. It yes, was, it was. It was actually a good race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which is good because we've kind of seen some races in the big final and the small final this season that haven't 
uh, haven't been as great because of slips and, and whatnot. Oh, and also, <laughs> the, the beginning of the men's round had a number of, well, it was like Fedrik's false start, and then I think there was like slip, slip. So, uh, so many slips so at this I event. Was yeah. Kind of thinking like, oh, geez, is, is this going to be that type of competition or, or final round, whatever you want to say, where it's just every race is a slip. It kind of seemed like that. It kind of seemed like we were starting out that way. Let me, uh, let me pull up the men's bracket and then we can just kind of like go over the, the, uh, uh, the gist of it. But like the start of this competition is <laughs> the yeah. start of this competition. Very first race, Vedric Leonardo has a false start, right? Like, what a disaster start for the guy who's the clear favorite. Kira Malkadabin not getting through qualifications, which by itself is, like, not super questionable because my understanding is he has an elbow injury, which is obviously going to kind of ruin your performance. But that means the two, like, top performers, not just from Indonesia but around the world, are out before we get to the round of eight. And that just opened up the doors to everybody. Like, Jun Yusakawa, who should have lost his very first race, ends up going all the way to the small final, right? And that's off the back of, like, a bunch of different, like, slips and crazy, uh, uh, you know, crazy happenings. But, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a wild uh, wild competition also losing uh losing uh it was a uh jung guo long that we lost in the first round and jim bao long in the second mm -hmm. just the favorites just absolutely falling apart early in this competition and it made it really one of those like oh anything can happen at this point not because the climbers are necessarily like subpar but because that wall was just kicking people off it like nobody could hang on to that thing it was really something else yeah it, it really was something else and uh, i was I think it's to kind of going back to the headlines here. I, I think it was it's it's good to kind of see this second tier. It's good that we know what they're capable of. I know Josh Herlebaus has kind of been saying that too. Like he's excited to kind of see this second tier push closer to the times of like a Vedrik and in the men's division, of course, like the women pushing closer to an Ola Miroslaw and, and the Kaluchkas and yeah. That's so, the real gap is, is the gap to Alexander Miroslaw. That's the, that's the one that's going to be tough to close. But on the men's side, you're right. Like the, the race that we saw today is we saw a bunch of Indonesian climbers who we typically wouldn't have in the top, like four international um, breaking five again and races against each other and i think my suggestion to anybody that didn't watch this is just like if you if you can't handle too much speed start the comp basically at halfway where you get to the semifinals, and it's just the top four from each gender the races are killer from that point out and i think you'll have a really good time just watching those races watching them back a second time like see what happened like when did they slip what happened with their feet where was it won and lost like really compelling uh uh viewing yeah, and this all ties into another headline here from Sitz, a uh, friend of the show, been on the show. He says, my headline, Indonesia dominates again with new athletes winning gold, which is exactly what we're talking about here. We got some some new faces because of all those surprising exits of uh, of the favorites. And and in the case of um, Kira Mal, maybe, a, maybe an elbow injury playing mm -hmm. into it. We'll yeah, Adi Miljono takes gold medal on the men's side. And on the women's side, Rajia Salsabila takes uh, her first gold medal. Um, again, the, the women's gold medal final is probably the most disappointing race just because Victoire Andrier is, in my opinion, like not quite at that tier. And if you just look at her times through the entire competition, none of them were at the level of what you'd expect um, uh, to, to get to a gold medal race. And again, Again, she benefited from a false start from probably the top or second best competitor at this comp, Dezak, uh, who had, again, a false start in the very first round. And that opened up the door for Victoire to get all the way through that bracket to the very, very end. It's crazy the stuff that we were seeing through the through the round of 16 and the round of eight. Yeah, and, I, you know, maybe her times weren't quite there, but I'll take it if it gets a French woman into the final in front of that in front of that Chamonix crowd because Fair that enough, was yeah. that was really cool to just see them so so hyped to have a you know somebody uh, racing for the the gold medal it was in in that story too as well in the in the women or uh, not in the women's in the lead uh, in the lead competition played out great for both men's and women's that's something that i think the french were very happy with was getting to see Alain genico and sam avazu both in the final it's like it actually turned out pretty well for the french sam avazu holding that high point for a long time i he was did. thinking that's like oh geez <laughs> nobody everybody was yeah it was good stuff do you what do you think 
how do you feel about the great light show that we got from the audience holding up their phones, not holding them up, holding them up, hold, not holding them up? How would you so, rate that? Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. I think audience par- participation is great. I think, and I just, why, why do we build up some of these things as like, oh God, like, and this is kind of like what I said last week about building us up for a surprise co-commentator and it ended up being Liv Egli. This was the same kind of thing where it's like, I think the organizers have something special planned for the break. And it's like, I would, if I was in the crowd, I'd be doing the same thing. Like, it's a cool little thing you get to do and it looks really neat for everybody. And it's, it's like, it's a good television. It's a nice thing to have on the camera, but man, like you got to stop setting me up for just like having all my expectations being just complete, like, oh, just, I set such a high bar when you're like, something special is about to happen. I can't. You know, I've seen that a million times, man. I've seen that in like any crowd of any sport in a concert. Like, yeah. So anyway, it just like we're building stuff up too much that is ultimately not not that cool. Yeah. Well, in that case, if people are watching, stay tuned for the end of this <laughs> debrief because we are going to have something very special that you will not want to miss. All right. All right. Stay all the way to the end. Get the, no, get they, the engagement they, up. Matt Groom definitely got me with that because I was... Uh, I was actually going to take a, during the break. I was like, oh, I'm going to go make another, you know, make another cup of coffee. Oh, did you get whatever. trapped? I got trapped. I was like, oh, I can't leave now. There's something special coming up. And there was a light show with audience participation. Eh, probably probably could have gotten my coffee. Um, uh, quickly to wrap up the headlines, because I think we kind of nailed the two biggest ones. Um Fred Al Silva says Chamonix is the headline. Climbing is back at home. I don't know if that's a joke about, you know, Innsbruck being declared like, you know, <laughs> the home of climbing. Climbing gets or climbing comes home, whatever their slogan was. But yeah, I think Chamonix is a better stab at it probably than Innsbruck does at this point, particularly in terms of like who's hosted lead comps that consistently. Trad guy, there's a red flag for me. Is somebody named Trad guy? How how far out of my universe this is going to be? Uh, his headline is "I'm Jerry Moffat" in quotes and in brackets because he knows he has to explain it to me. That's a hard grit reference, which I understand is apparently a movie about climbing outside. So I appreciate Trad guy. I don't know what that means yeah, because I'm the... such an I'm such a gym rat that Somewhere I don't know here. what we're talking about. I barely know who Jerry Moffat is. I've got so. uh, I've got the I've got the biography here, but I don't know if that helps us. Can uh, you do a Can you do a Control F on that book and find the phrase "I'm Jerry Moffat" and Jerry. tell me what that's supposed to mean? I don't know if it's a reference to like Toby Roberts or or his climb. I got no idea. I, I don't know. Yeah, all respect to Trad Guy. I don't. I'm not sure. I haven't seen. I've seen Hard Grit years it's, ago. This is the wrong show for Trad Hard Grit references. It's uh, maybe it's it really maybe maybe it really is. Jerry Moffat sitting there Maybe watching the debris in the Discord. <laughs> he just wanted to send Jerry Moffat. <laughs> It's like when you're, it's when your grandparents are on Facebook and they don't realize that they're sending a comment out to the entire world. They think it's a direct message. So they like, hi, Tyler, and then sign off at the bottom. Yeah, just Jerry Moffat accidentally got access to a computer, which he doesn't know. How to, yeah, that's yeah, probably more likely. Yeah, uh, yeah. spread the word. <laughs> Jerry Moffat is doing an Ask Me Anything in the Plastic Weekly Discord Yeah, as we speak, apparently. Uh, let's talk about winners. Um, a, a lot of people brought up Jane Kim for this, but of course, I think we've, we've covered that ground uh, pretty Pretty much but the other big winner from the event is obviously going to be toby roberts trad guy again says the winner is toby and the rub off on the british team um i'm not super in the loop but i think having one of those like halo athletes where you've got somebody to to rally around and cheer for and also just somebody to raise the level of training like you're like well toby's one of the best so i gotta try to keep up with him and that'll be good for me like yeah 100 percent uh, Bet Bergeon says Toby Roberts won with a top at the end and a well done interview. He is Olympics ready. Uncle Funkel also says Toby Roberts. What do we think of the Tobe man? Apparently, we're calling him the Terminator. I think that's kind of a lazy nickname, but whatever. Uh, yeah, I think we could think of something else. Probably. Um, but I, he was really good in his interview, his post event mm-hmm. interview. I was really p- pleased because he's you know, such a gut, young guy. I don't know how many interviews he's done, but he was really composed. I think he said it was, uh, what did he say? He said he was really pumped and his heart was pounding. Or It was a really nice interview. It got a lot of, he's got some charisma. So I, I and, and <laughs> he's got a lead gold medal and a Boulder gold medal. So that has, uh, kind of all signs pointing to 
potential Paris 2024 qualification. And I'm really excited. I mean, all of a sudden this season, Toby has become pretty much one of the most, if not the most intriguing guy in the, you know, in the men's division, the competitor in the men's division to see how he's going to do in the world championships. I'm really curious to see how he's going to do in this Olympic dual event combined format. I would imagine he's going to do quite well. I think he's certainly one of one of the favorites to, to make it to finals of the combined competition for sure. Um, you know, whether that ends up netting him one of the those three slots to the Olympics in the very first event, that's a really high bar for like any competitor minus probably Yanya, honestly. So it's like, it's still going to be hard for him, but he's certainly in the running. Um, the one the one thing I'm a little bit cautious about is like getting our hopes up a little too much, thinking that like winning a boulder and a lead in the same year like means a lot. Like, let's just, let's go back one year to Colin Duffy, who just like really started peaking in 2022, won the gold in Innsbruck and, uh, or sorry, won two golds in Innsbruck, both the boulder and the lead. And then just like, look at the kind of season that he's having this year, a really big drop off. Same thing with Sean Bailey, somebody that was winning the lead and the boulder a couple of years ago. Not like he's having the best time of his life either. So I would, I just want to kind of emphasize the men's field is very tumultuous. It is a, it is a, it's just some rough seas out there, y'all. And there's good days and there's bad days. And the Olympic Games themselves are a year from now. So just be, uh, uh, be a little bit cautious. What can look like a surefire bet one year can really fall off the next year. Um, so I just, I suggest everybody temper their expectations because things can look real good now and turn out to be a bit of a stinker later on. So uh, yeah, hold your horses. What do you think is going on with the American men? Because this has been a, a, a thread that we have had, I feel like, all season, going even into the Boulder season, where we've talked about it. We, we're like, gosh, what's up with the American men? Okay, maybe the next comp, the, the, you know, they'll kind of get back to their old ways or whatever you want to talk about it, uh, or however you want to phrase it. Yeah, like, and, and you could put Jesse Grouper in that list of men that you've listed as well. I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of keep expecting them to... F- Kind of find their mojo. I'll be honest. I I don't know, and I have no, I've got no insight, and also no particular background to to really kind of analyze it professionally in terms of performance or training cycles or anything like that. I think where I'm at though is. I'm willing to start asking that question seriously once the World Championships is over. Because the World Championships starts in about a month from now, so we've still got this 30-day period where people where you're going through this this really big change in your training cycle where you are peaking and then tapering or at least that's what you're trying to do. So it's it's kind of a, a moment where everybody's performance can kind of feel all over the place. You can have those days where you're like I'm as strong as I've ever been and then you go to a comp and you suddenly feel like you're more tired than you've ever been. So I I think this is a hard time of the season for people to gauge their performance. And while I, I totally agree that the it doesn't look great at this point, and so my you know, I'm I'm uh, I, I don't feel like high up on the US boys for, for the world championships. I think it's worth giving them a shot and see if maybe the master plan actually does work out because that's always a possibility too. We've criticized criticized a lot of climbers heading into big events and uh, and it turns out that they actually played it perfectly. Alberto Hinius Lopez being kind of the, <laughs> the the ultimate example of that from a couple years ago. So uh, so yeah, I'm not willing to talk about it just because I'm I'm honestly not sure where uh, where they're at yet. And I want to give him the benefit of the doubt because it is still like 30 days away before that gets started. Yeah, and that's the conventional wisdom too would tell you that the ultimate goal is what they're going for is to perform well at the World Championships this season. So maybe we'll uh, we'll wait and see. Yeah, 100%. Um, other winners, uh, who else we got? Well, Indonesian speed team, we kind of talked about them a little bit already, but uh, but just to uh, uh, to cover it again, uh, speed climbing, that's Josh who's been on the show before. Uh, Indonesian speed team, both genders, absolutely doing what they needed to be done for the wins. It's got to feel nice for the coaches of that team to see their top competitors, Vedric Leonardo, 
uh, Kiramal Kadabin and Dezak uh, Maririta Kasuma Dewi all drop out in the qualifiers or the first round and know that they have an arsenal of climbers that can come up behind them and be like, yo, we got this. Take this one off. That's got to feel uh, um, very vindicating for the coaching strategy and, and their entire model for speed climbing in Indonesia to see that kind of success, even when you lose all of your biggest stars. That's uh, something else. Yeah, and it's really good experience building for those competitors to to have a shot to have a chance to go deeper in the bracket that's it sounds kind of obvious but like that's how you get better right build that high-end high competitive experience by having a couple times where you go into the into the half final or the small final or maybe you even make it to the big final yeah Mm -hmm. that's how you build depth so Sits event slouten says the winner is addy and salsabilla obviously so good for them to take their turn and rishat Ludo and Vic setting really fast. Okay, Sitz has just chosen everybody as his winner, apparently. Okay, but more in general, he says, it is pretty awesome to see so much development on the speed route. If you take a step back and think about how many people have trained on this wall for so many years, yet still there's loads of new records. Just awesome. Um, yeah, can I, like, let's do a throwback just for the fun of it. We used to talk a lot about, like, what was the future of this speed wall? What was the future of this route? Was it going to be retired after the Olympics? Were we going to get in a cycle where we get a new route every four years? Like there was a lot of discussion within the scene and of course within the IFSC of, of, you know, what is the lifespan of a speed route? How far can we take this? And I think the development that we saw in that Olympic qualifying year of 2019 probably gave this route a shot in the arm that it desperately needed to stay alive. I think if we hadn't seen the Tomoa skip among other, you know, beta innovations that started dropping records like crazy, if we hadn't seen the boulderers come into the sport and really start innovating, I wouldn't be surprised if 2021 or 2024 were the final Olympics for this route. If the development had stayed at the same pace that it had been for a long time, maybe it would have just been called a day. But... Now, like, isn't it a blessing that we still have this route around because it feels like people are constantly optimizing and discovering new beta and and it's uh, it's still exciting to watch. Yeah. And what's the the footnote of it all? I I interviewed uh, Jackie Godoff not that long ago, and he said he he wants it to be changed. Right. (laughs) Uh, He he, and he's the guy that created it for anybody Mm -hmm. that might not know. He's the guy that that set the route and he certainly never expected it to last this long and so he would like to see a new route i i think also i i mean i love that there's so much innovation going on on this particular route but i do think that could be a kind of a fun way to mix things up is to have an another speed a different speed route and so you might have some competitors that specialize on one route and others competitors that specialize on another and maybe some are great on one, and that's the one they go to, and others. I, I think I don't, I, you don't want to get too many speed routes out there, but uh, I'm thinking, yeah, why not create a route that's just, like, totally different and just maybe brings in a whole new group of people that find it enjoyable and maybe are able to specialize in it in different ways. I mean, this is a little different than track and field in the sense of, like, 100 meters is – it's the flat hundred meters anywhere you Mm go. But we have the ability now to make a new course anytime we want with making up a new speed route. So that could be kind of, kind of fun, something for the future. Maybe I got to assume the ultimate setback is just like, I don't think speed climbing can like barely support itself as a discipline, honestly. And so segmenting the field of like, do you want people training just for one or the other? Are people going to find it worth trying to learn beta for two different routes if one of them only gets used for like tier two events? I feel like there's not a lot of incentive to introduce a new... It's the same kind of thing with with my game of CSGO where there's just a a bunch of multiple maps that you play on. And the, the current players, they don't want new maps added to the game because it's more stuff for them to learn that they could be at a disadvantage of they want to stick with what they know because that's what's winning them tournaments that's what they're playing on right now so why make it more complicated i think it is gonna have to be a thing where it's like you know what you set it you set a date and that's when it switches and the old route is dead and the new route is is being used from here on out Uh, yeah maybe i mean uh, wouldn't the the counter to that be something like (laughs) car racing where maybe there's you know there's a different track maybe a different course like totally but then the world but then the other. world record thing all falls apart and and whether or not that's worth it but that basically takes you back to classic speed almost where 
you know, half of the half of the speed venues on the circuit would have the same climb every year that they were there. And then some other venues would have a different route each uh, each time you're at the circuit. Yeah, I think for the sake of the world record, I, I really don't know. That's a good kind of question. Like, is there like a is there an incentive financially or in terms of viewers if there is a, a world record potential? But I think if we just watch like what the narratives are in current speed world cups world records play a huge role and it's always like how close can you get who's going to break it next who's getting the pbs and that becomes much harder to follow um if if you thought <laughs> if you thought commentators or audience members had trouble following aspects of our sport before now imagine the speed route is different every time and you've got different personal bests and different world records for each wall that you go to i think it might not be worth the headache when i think about it yeah yeah perhaps i i don't think it would be something where you just have a million different speed routes. I would think it would be a type of thing where, okay, maybe this is the, the IOCs and the IFSCs speed route. If another organization or entity wanted to get in the game of hosting climbing, like let's say, for example, maybe the, the X games would start having climbing. <laughs> I thought you are going to say the XFL. You're like, <laughs> no, we but... want to take that approach to rock climbing. Yeah, but, but that is a kind of a good reference XFL, how there are like a couple of rules that are different than mm. The NFL, right? And so to p players play in both, but they, they know the differences. So you could... And the XFL has never had financial issues in their, their long and storied glorious history, right? All right. I'm, I'm just kind of... <laughs> I'm just kind of thinking, uh, uh, but you, you I mean, obviously you make good points. I, I don't, th I think it'd be a hard sell for most speed climbers out there. To I guess, I guess what, what I want to say is like speed competitions still feel fresh. And I'm not sure that was a given as we were going into the Olympics, right? Like look at all these names that we're getting to know over the last couple of years since the Olympics. It's a new crop of stars. It's a new crop of beta. It's a new crop of times. Like it's, it's, it feels like this show has been rebooted, but in a really good way where we're seeing lots of new names and it's keeping it thrilling to watch every single week which maybe it didn't feel that way previously when it was a lot of the same names and that men's record hadn't been broken for years i think i think maybe it was starting to feel a little bit stale i think that's a that would have been a fair assessment back then and fortunately it doesn't feel that way anymore um john can i get you to find a loser that you like and i'm just going to wrap up a couple uh, a couple of, the, yeah. of these other wins um, over to the losers here yeah uh, yeah go for it you go first the one win i wanted to bring up was that this had very few ties for a chamonix world cup and aside if we just forget about the qualification round just pretend that never happened and all those ties it was actually pretty clean comp like semifinals was very well separated and then when it came to finals again there was a couple little uh couple spots where you saw two people in the same position but um, uh, uh, ultimately the, the orders were sorted out by count back. And so that was a success. Um, but a couple other comments from viewers, uh, Fred says the audience, probably the best in the whole circuit and both winners who deserved it. Uh, Kashka says the venue. Um, yeah, I think that is, I think that is, you know, the best part of Chamonix is the venue is that audience, which you can bank on every year, including when it's raining, man, it's, uh, it's probably the gem in the crown of, of world cups honestly i don't know what else would be up there at this point it's a stunner the 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 visual the 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 crowd all of it the new wall is great too it looks ah, really you, you're not a fan do you like it I, I think the red really pops i i i'm a fan yeah sure but... Yeah, yeah. What's I think your, it's just uh, kind of boring. I think it's like I, I don't know. It's like it kind of looks like every other wall. It's like let's do a three stage wall, and then you take off any any kind of like you know um, uh, anything that makes it special. Like remove all of the big like faux volumes that, that some of the walls have. Like I don't. I hated the Chamonix wall from last year where they added the four teal volumes. First of all, worst color in history. Teal is shit. Don't use teal for anything. Secondly, four very like protruding volumes must have been a nightmare for the root setters but the wall previous to this that we all still remember fondly with the large red triangle kind of in the center like approximately what Villars looks like I thought that wall was great and maybe it allowed for some like inside corners that made root setting hard here and there but it was much more distinctive um, I thought it was a little bit more iconic and also just your design being like the brand is kind of like blah for me I don't know it's uh yeah not, not my dream wall. I think it's a good wall. Like, I've got nothing wrong with it in terms of function, but I feel like you could have been a little bit more ambitious, maybe just add some character, like a little bit of spice. Yeah. Sure, sure. I hear you. Um, let me read off some losers here. Are you ready to... Hit me. To, so this is connected to something you just said, because you were saying that you thought, like, the separation was great and all of that. So Vladek said the women's final route... 
he, mm-hmm. he listed that as his as his loser. Uh, Do I think that Root is a loser, though? A I, lot, like a lot of shitty stuff happened on it. But how much of it was the Root's fault? That's a really good question. We've got like multiple things we can talk about for this one. So maybe we should just pick one to start with, I guess. Yeah. Do you want to talk about clips? Do you want to talk about 38 plus? What do you know? What, what do you want to start with for this one? Well, do you want to talk I, about Chayun or do you want to talk about like Helen Jenico and, uh, and all that stuff? I feel like those are the two big let's ones. Let's talk about Helene. I don't think that that will take as long as the as the Chayun So discussion. Okay, Ma- sure. Ma- maybe it will. I don't know. But let's start with Janico and then we'll... Maybe okay, we'll... let me bring up the women's the women's uh, final score sheet here. All right, here we go. It might look a little bit small, but the gist of it is Jane Kim gets the absolute high point, 43 plus. Me, or sorry, uh, Nonoha Kume and Ellen Jenico are tied uh, in the final at 38 plus broken by semifinals and then the next two spots jesse pills and miho nanaka are tied one hold below them at 37 plus and then the rest of the field kind of falls away after that um yeah so there's a couple things that make this a little bit uh, complicated to talk about first one is that the score is kind of like changed mid comp so you could tell that a lot of this scoring was determined based on either appeal or based on the jury kind of determining like, hey, there's enough difference between the way these climbers climbed that we feel comfortable assigning different scores based on their progression, even if it doesn't like fit the, the, the you know, the, <clears throat> the hard and fast rules of, uh, of climbing. But um, do you want to kind of like outline what the, the question was that people had, or do you want to kind of set the stage for the the uh, the move at least you want to describe the movement and I'll pull up the photo I got here. Yeah, so let me find the the con- okay. So this is a uh, we'll start by looking at the picture of the of the climb and then I can pull up the topo. Okay, um, so so let's first the the Caskia Ka- McKay. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, uh, for the loser says, judging how was that thirty eight plus for Helene Janico. So that for that, let's bring up. Here's a screen grab of Helene's climb. Let's and, use this to describe the movement, and then we'll pull up the topo and go back and forth between the two. Okay. I think. How's so that? I want, yeah, I, I want everybody to focus on her left hand, the one that's kind of up over her head in that in in that little overhead uh, kind of overhead Gaston type of position. Yeah. The so it it kind of does it an injustice looking at it as a screen grab because this looks was, quite static doesn't it It looks really <laughs> static and it was a far more dynamic movement she basically went from the hold where her right hand is it's kind of hard to see what holds her there but where her right hand is imagine she launches up with her left hand ever so briefly gets that left hand on the the gaston the little rail there and then and then shoots right up the right hand goes from where it is now up to a right hand gaston what they were calling the elevator door so, and so it's essentially i mean think of it like a paddle dyno that's kind of the the good point of reference not in terms of i mean obviously this isn't a, a paddle dyno but in terms of the paddle movement where her left hand just kind of briefly is there on that gaston and mm-hmm. then her right hand goes immediately to to the hold that's above it. So let's take a look at the topo here. Let me bring up the topo here. So I'll try and get them in line. So if we look at Helen Jenico, her right hand is on hold 37. Her left hand is currently on hold 38. And so the question is, how did Helen get scored 38 plus? And what makes this confusing is that in this moment, as Helen is climbing, her right hand is about to reach for uh, 39, but she falls going for that move. And because everything's happening so fast, Helen's left hand there on 38, which is in the in the photo, is barely on this hold for for even a second, right? It it her left hand reaches across, grabs that hold, and then the the right hand comes up, and so she's not controlling that left hand with what we would normally expect you would require to earn like a 38 on that hold, right? Normally you actually have to stick it and use it, whereas the argument is she was barely on that hold for that long. Um, but I think what what the the issue is here is that. The climbers uh, before her, um, or not before her, but but uh, uh, lower in the score, 
Um, they were reaching for 38, but were not actually managing to get any grip on it, and were especially not making any movement further towards 39. And so while Helene was falling on this move, she was still actually touching one hold further and making progression to the even further next hold. So it's one of those things where, like, the example I wanted to say is, let's say John and I are climbing this multiple paddle dyno where John and I you know, with all the climbing skills we have, we have to paddle like seven holds to get to the zone or something, right? So let's say uh, we're scoring this paddle dyno like a lead climb where each hold that we're paddling off of is one and then two and then three and then four. And when you're doing a paddle dyno, you're touching the holds for, for but a second, right? It barely means anything. And so let's say John gets like two holds in and I managed to get three or four holds in. Neither of us actually get to the zone, so our scores are are basically the same, like neither of us achieved anything on this boulder. But if you can break it down hold by hold, like we do in lead climbing, you make the argument that says, well, John only managed to use those holds and progress to the second one, whereas Tyler clearly managed to use and progress to the fourth one or something like that. And you say, so even while it was dynamic, even and even though Tyler and John were both never controlled or static or actually like using any of those holds, for a prolonged period of time, it's clear that Tyler got a few holds further than John. And I think that was the argument that was made. And that argument was necessitated because that scoring gap between Miho and Helen and Jesse and uh, uh, Nanoha was across the, the metal barrier. And we needed to decide who is in second place and third place and fourth place. And so I think the jury and possibly an appeal basically came to the agreement that like, yeah, we can measure that there is actual significant progress that Ellen made, um, that, uh, that Miho and Jesse did not. And they adjusted the scores to, to make it obvious who is ahead of the other. So that's, that's my, my read on the situation at least. And I think it's fair. It comes up sometimes. And, uh, because it's like a dynamic move and they were doing the move the way it was supposed to, it's like, okay, well, how do we judge this? Cause our standard for control in lead climbing doesn't suit dynamic movement that well. Right. That's kind of the crux of this. This argument is, you know, in bouldering, we see a lot of times where you use a hold for only a second. It doesn't come up so much in lead climbing. And this kind of uh, kind of showcased a bit of a conflict between the way lead scoring works and some lead climbing works. Yeah, I think this was a, a, a real futuristic <coughs> moment in a lot of ways for lead World Cup lead scoring, because I do think that this is probably something that we are going to see more and more as the bouldering route setting style uh, kind of enters into the lead climbing more. We're going to see more of these whatever kind of like glancing moves, uh, paddle moves, that type of thing where you're yeah. you're using a hold, but you're not using it in the sense of we how we traditionally think of using it on a lead climb. You're not like sticking it. You're, you're just kind of, like I said, you're kind of glancing it. Yeah. Uh, I think that we're going to see this more and more. So I think it's good that the, the judges and the IFSC start to really think about, yeah, how do we separate the scores? If you have a, in this case, it was kind of like a dynamic Gaston, but if it's a dynamic paddle dyno, uh, multi moves that the competitor is just going to like, tap just ever so briefly as they progress to a, a farther move mm -hmm. well, what if somebody taps here and and doesn't get any farther but there is a skill that comes with being able to tap farther so we should maybe score <laughs> farther or or in this case being able to kind of like yeah gas on so i i hope that i mean <laughs> if if anybody's able to kind of follow our our uh, explanation here uh, i i i think that this was a, a good a good moment for us to take it in as viewers, because I mm -hmm. do think this is something that's going to come up more and more as we see these like multi dynamic, multi level dynamic moves. Yeah. Just go back, go back, watch Helen's climb and watch Miho's climb. And if you just slow it down to let yourself like process that move, you, I think most viewers will come away as it being like a reasonable explanation. I think what makes it really difficult is first of all, it's incredibly hard to judge in the moment, right? So for the person with the topo and the scoring app, it's very hard to like confidently say when you're like 30 feet, 40 feet below the climber, okay, was that good enough? Like that's tough. That is the kind of judgment call that you probably do want video replay for. And because it's gonna take that long to make that confident call, I mean, what resources do the commentators have to explain that process of like, hey, this this move is a difficult call. There's a chance that 
that score is going to change because all of us only got to see it for but like one second. And uh, and so it makes it really hard for viewers to follow because so much is up in the air and left unexplained. Right. I think that's the real struggle with it is like how quickly can you make the judging call confidently um, and get it to the viewers while they're trying to wrap their head around that question of like, well, what that's that hold supposed to be 39. Why did they only get this? Or why did they get that instead? That's kind of has always been one of the weaknesses of, of lead climbing is is being uncertain of what hold is what like, is it 39 and 40? Or is it 39 and 40? Like there's so much stuff about lead climbing topos that is really hard to, uh, to communicate uh, to viewers. So I think, uh, I think ultimately this one worked out okay, but it would be nice if the commentators had the uh, opportunity and the resources just to like explain what happened and why. Um, so yeah, I think from the viewer perspective, that is actually a loser in that a really, uh, really consequential move was very difficult to understand uh, in the viewing experience that we had presented. So yeah, fair enough yeah. as a loser. Yeah, let me see if anybody else, maybe you can, look over these two i want to see if anybody else mentioned helene in the or, or that you know that move in the loser section here um i don't think so i know i know eddie uh circuit climbing mentioned uh mentioned just like commentary in general which we'll probably get to with the next one um but yeah that might have been the only uh yeah casca might have been the only person to really bring it up i guess um what else yeah. do we got in here Let's look. Speed climbing still beating away at that false start drum that we talked about last week. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, let's shout him out here. I will have the, he, speed climbing says I will have the false start being 0. 0.1 instead of 0. 0.00 as the loser <laughs> every time until the IFSC changes. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I, I like your I like your logic, Josh. So uh, I don't know if you should I, like seriously write a write a letter to the IFSC. You know, do a and, video, um, do a video, do a do video. A video. Yeah. 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 Anyway, some of these other, uh, let's do some of the small ones. Um, Sita says uh, his loser would be himself for not being there to see Jane Kim win. I kind of feel the same way. Like I was going to go to Chamonix and then at the last minute I was like, you know what, for vacation, I don't actually want to be around more climbing. So I went to Philly instead. Um, yeah. I, I feel a little bit the same. Sits. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um what else do we got? Uh, I, one of my losers was the setting delay at the start of the women's route. We waited 30 minutes yeah. watching. I think it was Jen Hiroshima. I'm, I'm not 100% sure who I should have looked before we talked about this. Um, <laughs> really struggling to find like a clipping position for him to like bolt in and, uh, and make the adjustment. And I'll be honest, I still don't know where the error was but it looks like because we saw two versions of topos in the discord chat and it looked like they probably made an adjustment to the route between semis and finals and somebody messed up and didn't add a hold on or something like there was just i think it was just one of those every route setter has gone through that experience at a comp where you're just watching climbers fall and you're like what's wrong with this boulder and then one person sheepishly is like i, for I forgot to put the hold back on so honestly, fortunately, we caught it before they started climbing because that would have been a way bigger disaster when a climber has just spent all that energy to climb. And then they're like, oh, are we just going to watch everybody fall at the same bottleneck and have the worst final ever? Or do we start everybody all over again? So catching it then was way better than catching it later. Yeah, that's where I <laughs> waffle back and forth, because on the one hand, I agree with this, you know, mentioning this in the loser set you got to start on time production wise you ha especially if you're trying to grow the sport you presume there they're, they're going to be new eyes on every competition you can't have the fans especially the first time viewers waiting around for 30 minutes because they won't they won't wait around the, the, the you know they'll go do something else it's not it's not engaging on the other hand it could have been a much worse disaster in terms of just being you know, boring and and if and just a kind of a production nightmare if you had had a competitor actually go out and start climbing and then they get there and and then the route setter realizes and i mean what do you do then right you have to if you realize it after the first climber comes out you'd have to i don't know presumably give them another go 
you'd have to wait a while because you'd probably rest. It'd just be, like I said, it'd be a logistical nightmare. It'd be a production nightmare. So, yeah. And I, I just want to emphasize like how, how making tweaks before, like making big tweaks like the ones that we saw there between semis and finals can really mess things up. Because if you hand all the judges a topo and the technical delegate has the topo and nothing's being changed, it's actually pretty easy to see early on if something is missing, right? But if the root setters are working away and they're putting up holds and the judges have been told, oh, we're making a change so we don't have a topo ready and the JP doesn't have a topo ready, nobody can look at the climb yet and actually determine if it's correct or not. So it basically delays the entire quality assurance process by hours by making those tweaks later on. And it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it also doesn't surprise me that it's in that scenario that this happened because it really messes up the flow of everybody when they have to wait longer for a topo to come out and for the root setters to finish to actually know what the finished product is. So that's just like a tough scenario all around. Fortunately, the climb was good. If they had gone through all those tweaks for like a not very good climb, that would, <laughs> that would have felt pretty awful. But fortunately, it was maybe worth it. I don't know what it would have been like without it. Like I can't prove a negative, but uh, but yeah. And it, it, what was funny is, so the competitors came out for a, another observation of the route once that hold right. was put up. And I'm sure, I, I would I would think that nobody tells them that that is the hold that's been added, right? I would think that that would be uh, kind of... They, they know, certainly I, could have. Yeah, it might have been easier just, just to be clear because so much of the route didn't change. Like maybe they just said like, hey, to, to make this faster for you guys, look midway through. There's a giant hold that wasn't there before. Like there's nothing like on site ish about it that changes it rules wise. So I feel like it's still I don't know. I don't know what happened. though. Yeah, I don't know, though, because it was on a volume like you don't want to. I mean, obviously, probably nobody would have. It was a big hold. So it's unlikely that somebody would have not seen a hold of that size. Mm. But they don't normally tell the competitors where any of the holds are. Right. Like it's, it's up yeah. to the competitors. To, yeah. To... It's especially, you know what, the, the imagery I had in my mind and Natalia Grossman wasn't here, but for those not in the know, Natalia is kind of notorious for sketching out entire routes. Right. So I kind of just had this fantasy in my mind where Natalia gets told like, oh, we made a change. And I just imagined her ripping a page out of her like notebook, crumpling it up, throwing it away, like gab grabbing her pen again, you know, getting ready to do it all over once again. That, that kind of, unfortunately she wasn't there, but uh, yeah, that's, well, that was the joke in my head. Well, my, my point was, I don't, th I mean, they don't normally tell the competitors where all the hold, where holds are because that's up to the competitors to either see the holds sure. or not see the holds. And so mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't know, but I don't. I'm guessing they didn't tell the competitors that they added that hold. So the competitors came out and they had to observe again, and it was kind of a little game of like, "Where's Waldo?" Like spot the addition, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Which yeah. was kind of funny to me. I, I was just kind of thinking of all the competitors, like trying to recall. Okay, did I notice this hold the last time we were out? The whole here? like yeah, like spot that. ten differences, and you're just like, yeah. what, 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 what's different? Yeah, this yeah. the person has three fingers, and then that person has two. Like, yeah, yeah, I know They're what you mean. They're the same route. No, yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. Just, they're the yeah. same picture. Yeah, classic, classic <laughs> right. meme format. Right. Uh, yeah, let's hit some other losers. Let's do the big one. We got to talk about Cheyenne. So um, this was the most mentioned loser in all the comments. Uncle Funkle, just straight up, Cheyenne is the loser. Um, I, I don't. This one user insists on making their username like nineteen numbers in a row. So I'm going to pronounce it like it's Leet Speak, and I'm going to say their name is Tazbitust. Taz Batust, otherwise known as 742-617-000027. What a shit username. Um, <laughs> they say their loser is Chayun and people listening to the commentary during her incident. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I think uh, I think both of those are reasonable. Nevtrick2 says, Chayun, it was her chance to get gold without Yanya. And that mistake was so stupid. Maybe a bit harsh, but yeah, like it was 100% it was her mistake. <clears throat> uh, and then... Um, Lastly, on specifically Chayun, Lulu Climbing says, so she's been chasing the lead podium so far and was set up to win with Yanya absent. Yeah. Um, did you have expectations yeah. for like who was supposed to win this comp when we got to finals? Like, did you have a favorite? I I thought it would be Chayun probably mm -hmm. because uh, for exactly the reason these, I was thinking, think back to Jakarta last year, um, Brianne Son last year, where Yan is first and Cheyun is second at both of those. Mm -hmm. uh, or Sh Chamonix last year, uh, I think it was Yanya, L Yanya, Lar, Regora, and Ch and Cheyun. I think I think Lar was sandwiched in between the two of them. 
but Laura was out here. I think she, she finished 20th or something. So it's, yeah, to this person, to these comments of like, with Yanya gone, if you, especially if you look at the results from last year, yeah, I thought it was going to be Cheyun. I, I really did. When you you texted me and you were thinking, you said, oh, it's, it's like 50 50, Jayin or Cheyun. And I was thinking, mm. well, the thing is, I, I sent that when only Cheyun was left to climb, right? Like, and that was honestly part of that was like rational analysis. And part of that was like the entire universe is crumbling just so, just so Jayin can rise. Um, but I think it's a reasonable expectation. Like I thought it was Jesse Pills or Cheyenne. I think they were the clear favorites over everybody else. My biggest concern for finals was like, is it going to be a shit show of tops, right? Like that was, if I had a prediction for actually that we were joking about it in the discord as people were making predictions. And the joke was, do you think there's going to be tops and like ties, or do you think there's going to be no ties? And, uh, and that was probably the biggest concern of everybody. Not so much who is going to win. Cause we thought, well, if it's just a shit show of tops, you know, whoever wins is going to come down to a technicality of countbacks or time. And so we weren't really expecting these kind of scenarios. But um, let's talk about Cheyenne and let's talk about the move. And then that kind of gets us into the, all the commentary complaints that people are making. That is definitely the second biggest loser, as suggested by the crowds, is the quality of the commentary, which is a bit too vague. It is really kind of specific to this event. So at about the 20 hold mark, there is a traverse sequence um, where Chayun sadly skipped a clip and clipped into uh, a hold uh, or clipped into uh, uh, the the subsequent clip, which is illegal in IFSC rules. Um, you must clip the clips in sequence, the second you clip out of sequence, your climb is over. That rule is there to protect the safety of the climbers. We never ever want to incentivize climbers getting higher just because they think like, oh, I can find a safer clipping position higher up, or I can get more points the higher I go and I'll clip later. We don't want to give the climbers any more incentive to put themselves in an uns unsafe position because there are some climbers that will do that. And there are climbers that have, and of course it happens much more outside where people take mad runouts in the chase for, for that red point, in the chase for that flash outside, and it makes things much less safe and we can't accept that in competition climbing. And so the rule is you clip you clip them in sequence uh that way we keep everybody in a reasonable distance from the draws so we don't have traumatic falls so we don't have injuries for the climbers so we don't have injuries for the belayers i know places like reddit and the youtube comments take issue with this rule and they think like maybe there should have been some leniency in this case this is a very easy rule to understand and it is an unfortunate mistake and she's not the first person to make this mistake but it's a really important rule for just the safety of athletes and so i'm not really going to entertain like any any adaptation to it i think it's it's an elegant rule it's effective um and uh i think we should we should stick with that but um the well all that being said <coughs> And I, I agree. I mean, I think those that's a a great point. That rule, changing that rule should be a non-starter. But then I think the clips, you would hope the sequence of the clips would be pretty obvious and apparent to the competitor in the moment, right? You, you And I'm glad you bring up this picture here because this is case in point. We got the mind meld going on. I know where you're heading, yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you explain what we're looking at here? This is Cheon on the finals route right at the clips clips plural in question. Yeah, so this is moments moments before the disaster. Um the next clip that Cheyenne is supposed to clip in this moment is the small black quick draw at the top right of the screen. It is hanging just over those blue uh, dual text holds at the top right of the screen. That's what she is supposed to clip right now. She probably should have clipped it from earlier in this sequence, but she could still clip it from the hold that she's on right now. Remember that she's in a traverse sequence, so her body is hanging largely horizontally. She's looking kind of in the other direction from the clip that she's supposed to be uh, clipping and you see that she's looking at this giant orange draw right now and that is the one that she is going to clip which is incorrect unfortunately so she clips this thing uh she actually notices her mistake she unclips it and uh, uh clips the other ones correctly in sequence but that is not how the rules work the second she clipped that orange one her climb is over um so that's what happened and 
that's sad for Chayun. It's a mistake of her own making. Sometimes you could say like, yeah, occasionally you might argue that uh, like a draw is kind of hidden or like a sequence kind of takes you far away from from a draw. Um, I think the better argument for that was in semifinals. Masahiro Higuchi missed the first clip, right? He missed the very first one because it was kind of out to the side and like, I get it, it happens, but he was the only one that it happened to. So Clearly for other climbers, it wasn't a problem of seeing it. It's just an unlucky thing. It happens to the best of us. It happens to you in the gym. I'm guaranteed it has happened to you in the gym before. So, you know, that's uh, it's just how it goes. Um, but the real conversation is about the coverage and the confusion. And so I think we should break into that. Um, John, I'm guessing you were watching on your own because you're you're like you've reached the age where you're too old now to like get in the discord. Is that what I understand? Like you're, no, you're, I... at, you're at Jerry Moffat level or you're not quite sure what... Uh... <laughs> I am Jerry Moss, or whatever, whatever that quote was. No, I need to, uh, I keep getting this, I can't open the Discord. I need to update my operating system. So, uh, no, much love to the Discord. I'd love to be a part of it. I just need to get on uh, updating. So, this. I just want to, I kind of want to know what your experience was when you watched this. Like, I'm assuming you went through the same kind of confusion that most viewers did who weren't watching along with anybody else, right? So can you kind of tell me what you remember from when you watched it live? Like, I, It was mass confusion. I wasn't sure what happened because that explanation that you just gave was not given. We mm -hmm. didn't get, uh, we did not get explanatory replay of what happened. We That's got true. some replay of like just not like not of the issue like we got replays of her clipping but you're like well that's not in that doesn't I, it was just a mess and then there's this matt on commentary was saying that the rope was ghost clipped that it, it that, you know it got that it clipped and itself yeah it clipped itself and i'm thinking <laughs> like that doesn't uh. happen so I was so honestly in the moment I was ready to believe it. Like I, at the moment, everything was so confusing. I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe that did happen. Right. Like the, the, the replays that we got to try and explain what happened were so unsatisfying and completely useless in trying to actually see what, see what went on. Like that's a totally decent hypothesis, right? It's a, uh, yeah. Well, it was really confusing because it said like we saw she... just earlier in this comp, we saw Laura's like clip in one of the qualifiers literally unclip itself. So at this point, like I've suspended my disbelief for uh, for clipping and unclipping um, by themselves. Well, it just I mean, at the base level, it was really confusing because what we were being told is she skipped a clip and then we get replay and we look at the route and both are clipped. Mm -hmm. So she it's like we there's not a skipped clip there. They're both clipped in. So what happened here? And we never really were given any explanation on that. I was very lost and i yeah. had to ask you like what what do you think's going on here so all right yeah so let me let, let's break down the the loserness of this just so we we kind of know what everybody's thinking and where we're at so we'll we'll go through the harsh comments that we got from from the user which are still relevant because it was a really like kind of crappy viewing experience trad guy says the loser was the commentary it feels like it needs more investment to take it to the next level doesn't mean get rid of matt but the co-commentator co-commentator needs to cover matt's weaknesses stats and maths more prep and more data to drive better stories. So that's not quite related, but but talking about bringing uh, new components to commentary. Uh, Emma says, commentating, no explanation around Cheyenne's call down. Confusion without answers is an excellent way to put it from that, Emma. That, that is exactly no explanation because we, are, all we were told, that's what I, I, well said on that, the the user that wrote that, because we, we were told she skipped a clip. That's all we were told. And then we see the video and both are clipped. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, wait a minute. What? She didn't skip a clip. It, yeah. Yeah. And then Eddie actually had this as his headline, not as his loser. So he's going for the throat, apparently. <laughs> and he says, my reasoning is it is time for the commentary team to have multiple monitors to be able to better present the action. Read the comments on YouTube. And there's half the comments about the commentators and half about the climbing. And I think his point is that, you know, it should never be the point of a sport where the commentary itself is more sensational or more like, um, uh, uh, controversial than the event itself, right? Like we want the sport to be the star, not the the uh, like lackluster production, right? Is is Eddie's point? And I, and I think to, to to that, I think I remember it might have been on this show or somewhere else talking. To, I remember Charlie Bosco said, uh, and you hear this about like people say it about editing in movies and stuff. But Charlie Charlie was always saying like if you kind of notice the commentator, then he then 
that he's not he doesn't feel like he's doing a good job like the commentary should complement and should go perfectly with what's going on and and i don't mean you shouldn't notice them in terms of they can't mm. make a great call obviously they can and they should but i think i feel like a, a good way to put it is it shouldn't be the story itself right like the sh- story should still be the sport yeah. yeah um well let's let's break this down because i want to i want to make sure we're all on the, on the same page with this so we're going like we're this is you like you went hardcore with the um uh, with the hug analysis, which which everybody's begging for more John Bergman hug analysis for the next yeah. World Cup, um, but let's just let's just break down kind of what the experience probably was for the commentators. <clears throat> so first of all, as has probably been well trodden. Um, the commentators have a single screen and that screen is an output screen where they are seeing exactly what you, the viewer at home are seeing. They don't have multiple views depending on the event. They might have a view of the climbing wall, but they often don't have a view of the climbing wall. So the information they get is actually the exact same as what you are seeing at home. Now look at this camera shot, which was what was live at the time where this whole error happened. First of all, it's kind of a disorienting camera shot and you might not be able to pick out immediately which draw China is supposed to clip first. Um, it's not super easy to tell what the order of these draws are or even which direction Cheyenne is supposed to be going at the moment. And last thing before we move on to the next step is at this moment, uh, Terry and Matt were talking about the context of, of Cheyenne's climb and they were talking about how Jane Kim was guaranteed a podium and how uh, Nanoha was guaranteed a, a podium. And so I'm willing to bet at that moment, they were actually looking at score sheets, actually looking at the app, trying to build some context so that a minute or two from now, when Cheyenne gets towards the top, they can have built the storyline up to those final moves of Cheyenne determining who gets gold, who gets silver and so on, which I think is totally appropriate because where Cheyenne fell, nobody else had fallen. This was an elementary part of the route that there was really nothing thrilling about it, right? Again, Cheyenne wasn't struggling through these moves. She made a clipping error. Um, And so I can completely sympathize with the commentators having their minds on other things. And even if they did have their eyes on the screen, it may not have jumped out to them in that very moment that she had clipped the wrong draw, right? So, So that's the problem is she clips that first one, and then she unclips it, clips the other draw, reclips. Terry notices like, oh, she's having some trouble with that clips. And at that point, they're kind of like clued into, oh, she's doing stuff that's like weird. We don't know exactly what happened, but she's doing weird stuff. They could probably tell from the floor that she was being called down. And all of a sudden she's on the ground. And while the commentators don't know exactly what happened, they know that there were some errors with clips. And so they're discussing on the stream, like, you know, something happened. We're waiting for a replay to find out you know, what happened with uh, with, uh, with Cheyenne's clips. And the real disaster is when the replay comes in, it's a useless replay. They show a replay of Cheyenne after she made the wrong clip and after she reclipped them in sequence. So the view shows you that she's clipped everything in order. There's no Z clips. There's no missing clips. The replay they got answered none of the questions of the commentators or the audience. So everybody's left there further feeling like idiots, like, oh, we don't actually know, you know, what happened with this entire thing. And instant replays is extremely difficult in the first place. And even more so if you happen to have maybe a producer doing the replays who is not super experienced with climbing or has any experience with a situation like this, which is like, let's admit this is a rare situation. Um, So it's just kind of one of those things where there's so many different components where everybody involved like didn't quite have the resources to pull off a very difficult broadcast moment and the part that makes it suck is it was the most consequential moment of the entire competition so i know for sure that matt is really mad at himself for not looking at the screen at that moment i know for sure he feels like he failed in that big moment and he did but it's a, a pretty relatable failure in terms of broadcast. It's a it's happens in just a just an instant, and the information you're getting isn't great. So I it's one of those things where like yeah, it was a hundred percent a failure. I'm not saying it was a failure of Matt necessarily. It was a failure of the broadcast as a whole. Um, and so I think I think the 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 heat should probably be backed off Matt a little bit and be more of just like, you know, this was a hard moment to broadcast in the first place. And the IFSE is not kitted out with the manpower to handle this kind of instance. Right. So that's kind of my breakdown of it. Yeah. And I said that you would hope that this, the sequence of the clips is apparent and obvious. 
this kind of falls on Cheyun because the fact that other competitors seemingly did not have any problem reading yeah. that sequence. Like it'd be one thing if everybody was mis you know skipping the clip, then we could say, okay, this is a bad. Th these clips are set in a bad spot. Like this is just really confusing. But it wasn't that way. It was just Cheyun. So yeah, she was of... crying at the end for a reason. She knew she messed up and she was really disappointed in herself, right? And Cheyenne was not one of the people suggesting that she should have been given a second chance or suggesting that the rule was stupid or suggesting that the root setters did a bad job, right? She knows she made a mistake and it sucks, but it was entirely her fault. Like, yeah, that's just and how it goes. Uh, people have pointed out, that I think it was a really classy move from Jayene to mention on commentary how I, I think Jayene was echoing the same thing that we were all experiencing which was gosh i'm really happy for jayin but i'm also like really bummed for cheon and kind of just miffed at how this thing ended this anti-climax you could tell the crowd didn't even know what happened like it was it was silent the comp had just ended and cheyenne had fallen and it was you could tell it was the sound of confusion right it was it was a very lackluster way to finish a comp yeah yeah, it was, uh, and a, a weird bookended final. I think I said this in my write up of it. It, was, it bookended by the production delay, the long production delay at the beginning. And then at the end, we had this weirdness with Cheon. Just a very odd final round. And fortunately, with Jane's accomplishment, her historic win, this goes back to what we said at the top of the debrief here, that it kind of manages to rise above all this stuff. And I do think, I mean, it was, okay, so it was kind of a, a fluky win in a sense, but I think we've seen that as time goes on, that that doesn't really matter. Like, like now you're like... And I, yeah. I also want to say that I don't think, like... I don't think Chayun's misclip really affects that much about Jane Kim's win, as I say in the video I did last week. Um, it's just that, like... There were other cruxes in that climb. Jane Kim had a superlative climb compared to the others. And Cheyenne absolutely, within just her average day, could have completely fallen at any of the multiple cruxes that she had yet to uh, get to. So while it leaves a sour taste and like it sucks that how it sucks that that's how the comp ended. <clears throat> and it sucks that Jane Kim didn't really get to enjoy her victory because she was busy consoling this this you know, this teammate of hers, I don't think it affects Jane Kim's win. I think the state of the field affects it much more. Yeah, yeah I, well said. I, let's look at some other losers here. Before we do, I want to just like, I want to give some positives on the commentary. Um, it's their first time doing it, I think, but Albert Oak uh, delivered a lot of salient information that made the viewing experience for the speed final much better. I think he did a great job. Um, if he does more of them, I'd be really interested to see how he develops over time. Obviously he wasn't hired to come out to Chamonix for the broadcast. So I doubt that will happen sadly, but if there's a speed comp at Salt Lake next year, get him in the chair, get him in with Matt or with Megan. I don't care who, but put him in there because he knows his stuff and he can offer really good illustrations. Um, and Terry Cordy, I thought it was kind of cool to see that, chemistry that i guess they've worked out in epic tv i thought they had some cool flow um and i also appreciated it kind of looked like she did her research which i think is an important add-on to matt's broadcasting because i think matt is one of those people who is calling what he sees in the moment which is excellent for commentary but if he doesn't have all of the history and stuff tucked away in the back of his head one of the important roles of the co-commentator is to be able to bring some of that historical relevance. And it looks like based on her Instagram and also just based on what she was saying on commentary, Terry bothered to put in some of that work ahead of time because she had some of that stuff off the top of her head. Um, so for both of them, for their very first time doing IFSC commentary, thumbs up. Um, good job. Yeah. I'm I, sure yeah. you won't get to do it ever again. I'm sure other athletes will do it. Um, but, but I thought you did a good job for your first tries, everybody. Yeah, and it did seem like Terry really knew her. She had a lot of references of what competitors had done outdoors in terms of their difficulty, difficult routes. And, and I know that that's not everybody. See, you know, that's the one skill set that Matt does have. Like, that's the, the one thing that Terry doesn't need to bring. But, yeah, still. And I thought, I know that somebody said that she, uh, they need more stats. I actually thought that she, she was riffing off a lot of stats uh during the during the final round and the semifinal mm -hmm. round of she would say something like so and so is climbing now their previous 
uh, you know, last time they were in Chamonix, or yeah, in Chamonix, they they got a bronze medal or whatever. I, I thought there was a lot of stats there. Maybe maybe room for more, but. Um, yeah. This is this is a very minor nitpick, and it's not meant to be taken as criticism. But I find it very confusing when people go back and forth between citing their medal history for their entire career and then switch to citing their medal history for like just that particular event. Like going between lifetime stats to Chamonix stats, I kept being like, "No, that's she got her first medal in in like 2011." I'm like, "No, that's not." And I was like, "Oh, this is just Chamonix," or like, "Oh, this is lifetime." That that was really jarring. But uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do question. think she, she was armed. She had access to the to the media portal clearly based on the medal count and all she had. Yeah. Yeah, my big question when when they were shouting out Giants, all of Giants medals, I was wondering, okay, is this including her Milan bouldering, the, the boulder gold, gold medal or not? Are we just if talking they, if about? They, I can't remember what they were saying, but if they said thirty, then that has to be lead only, because yeah. I'm pretty sure her Inzai win was her thirtieth medal in total, in, or thirtieth gold including the the uh, bouldering gold yeah i think they were touting the 30 yeah. i think they were saying 30 on her profile picture which would include the i don't know milan hopefully bouldering. it meant just lead but but you know yeah. who knows um yeah. yeah what are what are some other uh losers that you uh that you saw here that you want yeah to... so uh related to the commentary in a way uh fred Paul Silva says, IFSC, the Red S scandal and the use of the stream to damage control. It didn't feel subtle, did it? That was that was that was the one thing I would say is like exactly two minutes into each broadcast, Matt bothers to take the time to say, you know, there's been a lot of controversy about this this eating disorder and bmi and red s stuff the ifsc has published a statement find it on their website etc and then and then dismiss it and i'll be i don't think commentary is is the right spot to have an in-depth conversation on the health and well-being of athletes like i don't think that's his responsibility but it does feel shoehorned in like i think it would be a little more like what what do i want instead like what did, what did you think about it what was your impression from hearing that hearing that spiel being made three times across the weekend it felt very it's pretty boilerplate uh, at the very least yeah my my mind as an american is like white house press secretary type of thing where it's like yes we're aware of this and we're working on it and you can read the press release mm. that like that's kind of the standard uh, go to which it's like it gives you information without really giving you any information. Hmm. Um, I think it did feel like yeah, it was very targeted. A couple minutes into every uh, all the rounds, Matt it would have been. I think what yeah. what I would have preferred more is that if they had just only talked about it for the lead final, maybe in that giant thirty minute break, and maybe they could have taken the opportunity to actually read the IFSC statement, which is pretty lackluster when you consider like how long these issues and this research and this development has been going on, I feel like that would have been a little bit braver is if the IFSC had told Matt like, Hey, can you just read this? So people can like hear what we said rather than saying like, yeah, we said something where we've addressed it. Don't worry about it, guys. Everything's fine. We're paying attention. Like I thought that was kind of lame. And again, I'm not, this isn't Matt's job at all. Um, I just felt like it was kind of a, um, <clears throat> Not not a brave way to try and to try and sweep it under the rug. Yeah. Yeah, it's it gets kind of funky though, right? Because then it's like if they they don't have an, a, a long enough platform, obviously, to go in detail. So if they don't if they don't say anything, then you're going to get criticism as well, probably, right? Because people are saying, how can you not even acknowledge on commentary that this. Huge I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I feel like that would be like, I feel like maybe people would roast them for not addressing it. Well, some that, people I mean. like that's maybe I mean. some people, but also you wouldn't expect that in like, you know, if I don't know if there's like some like NFL scandal or something, do you expect, you know, like I'm, I don't expect Jim Nance to come on and say like, and here's a, if you're wondering about the thing, you can go to the NFL commissioner and read the statement. Like normally that stuff gets out to the press through other means, right? Like they addressed it apparently at the technical commission or sorry, at the, uh, uh, technical briefing. Um, yeah, it can get out other ways. Um, so yeah, yeah, I was, I can go either way with it. Yeah, um, me too. but it, it just felt like an, an odd, uh, we didn't have to go over it every time, much like we don't have to go over the reason why we call Anastasia Sanders Annie every time she's on the screen. I so think I think I, that has been explained. I think we can leave it. <laughs> I want to know, 
how forceful was her mom in telling Matt <laughs> that she does not want to be called Anastasia? Because we hear that. We hear every time she Matt makes a point. Her mother told me. She does not like being called. You know what? It does kind of, it brings to light how, like how stuck Matt is between a rock and a hard place, because we always hear, you know, if, if a commentator mispronounces somebody's name or uses the wrong name, which Matt is guilty of a lot. And, and a lot of commentators in history have been too, uh, of mispronouncing or, or using the wrong names or getting the first name and the last name mixed up based on if you're trying to, you know, do it the Asian order or not. Like I totally get it. Um, but you, I, I, I mean, I know he knows this too, and we should know it too. Like if he starts calling her Annie Sanders without that explanation, there will be somebody in the YouTube comments who's watching their first comp being like, why are you using such a disrespectful, diminutive nickname for Anastasia Sanders? Her name is right there on the screen. Why so bad commentator? Like, you know, that would happen. And so that's kind of, I think we should, we should be aware that like that commenter is in our community. That's something that people like would say if he didn't explain it. So I think you should stop saying it because I think it's silly, but there would be that person. So I get it. I want to get an explanation. Should we call him Alexander Magos or Alex Magos? Yeah. Because on the screen it says Alexander, and yet I hear him called Alex. So somebody, just... I still don't know how to pronounce Laura Rigora without it sounding ridiculous because that name rhymes too much the way I just pronounced it for me to not think it's a cartoon character. But I'm too Canadian to say Laura Rigora or anything like that. So I'm, that was you know, good. I can't, I can't do that either. Or Ragara, do I don't know where it's at, man. I don't know what I'm saying. Can you do it, do it one more time. The the. <laughs> <laughs> I got the hands out. I gotta be careful. Yeah. No, I'm uh, you know, Laura Ragora. You gotta you gotta get the commentator from uh, Arco, the the MC from all the Arco comps to do it. She would nail that. Yes, she would. Uh, speaking of Laura Ragora, though, yeah. uh, she's listed here. So that's a good segue. I know. I don't know how to talk about it, given what we just spoke about. So I might just leave it. But go ahead. So uh, this person, uh, Baber Jans, says, La Rigora barely made semis and looked weak on the route. She's not what we were used to. Uh, so this is, <laughs> this is a real interesting <laughs> comment because I, I looked back at her results it seems like 2021 was she was rocking and rolling that season and then 2022 going by the results here she was she started off the lead season in line with rocking and rolling she was fourth place and when we say rocking and rolling she was like a consistent finalist if not a medalist like in yeah. 2021 2022 right like yeah well like halfway through 2020 kind of fell off towards the end yeah, yeah. so yeah. uh innsbruck 2022 to kick off the lead season she was fourth uh vilar the very next comp she was fourth again in lead and then chamonix 2022 she was second so she gets on the podium and then between Chamonix and Briançon 2022, she goes from, okay, so she goes from second place at Chamonix to sixth place at Briançon. Not a huge drop. But then Briançon to the European Continental Championships, which you would, it's it's less of a competitive, it's still very competitive, but right, you don't have the. It's Japanese, less of a field, yeah. Right, and you don't have the American. She gets 26th at the European Continental. So that's, that's where you kind of look at that and you're like, huh, I kind of would have expected Laura to probably get higher than 26 at the Europe continentals. And since and then, just to summarize it, she basically has not made finals anymore and she's ending low in semifinals. 17th, 13th. She, yeah, Jakarta, she was okay. But yeah, like, and then, and then this season it's like a 10th, a 17th. Yeah. 20th. It's a really easy drop off to see. 100%. So it's like midway through the 2022 season. Yeah. There was a noticeable, difference change in in her statistical results and that continued here yeah and it's hard to say if there was a change that happened then and then it has caused all of the effect that we've seen since then or if it was like you know she had a mid-season dip and then this season she has made a change or hasn't been able to recover like I, i'm it's not necessarily that there was a particular event that happened and everything's gotten worse since then but that's what her results show yeah i don't know what to say kind of like we were talking about with the men's uh americans like do i want to comment 
with the world championship coming up maybe she's gonna peak at the perfect time i don't know but uh yeah she is like she is not a name that i have as a as a favorite for finals anymore and there could be a lot of reasons that people think about for that um and uh yeah i don't uh, i don't know how much more i can <laughs> want to expand on that but i imagine everybody watching an hour and 30 minutes into this show can make a couple different assumptions and say like maybe oh maybe it's something maybe it's maybe it's something um yeah I, I do i do in my head still think of her as and maybe we i don't know looking at these stats maybe we shouldn't have this this assumption but i kind of think of her as a top five you know a uh, top five competitor a, a sort of a a go-to finalist at any given event and yet the recent results don't really bear that out mm -hmm. so yeah, like the old meme was like she was a she was like a surefire finalist so long as there wasn't too big of a dino in semifinals, right? Like that was a joke where she was a very strong climber with a particular weakness, and now it's it's more like this is a, a climber who's just not not a finalist anymore. So uh, yeah. don't know, don't really know what to say about that one at the moment. Yeah, I don't know. Let's. Uh... It's a it's a good observation though. I, can we end with uh, with this last one that just makes me laugh because I don't know if it's a joke or not? Yeah, let's do, let's do it. Yeah, Kairos climber says the big loser from this event is toby roberts because he showboats too much <laughs> i'm gonna give i'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt i don't know if it's a joke or not and if it's not a joke it's it's a reasonable opinion i guess anyways but i want i loved it i love that like there's a trade-off right when you get two moves from the finish and you decide oh i'm gonna take some time to like turn around and wave to the crowd and go one-handed you are you are <laughs> you are taking a risk and that by itself is thrilling. I'm. I thought it was very compelling and and charming to see him to see him turn to the crowd and say, "Hey, I'm topping this fucker." Like I thought that was awesome, man. Yeah, I loved it. I, I I mean, granted, it always makes me nervous whenever people start celebrating or hyping the crowd yes, before yeah. clipping the chains or before matching the top in bouldering. I'm not saying that I didn't have a little bit of anxiety watching him, but that being said. Gosh, give me that type of energy, that competitor, yeah. that charisma any day over yeah. fill in the blank of a number of other competitors that we've seen that are talented but just have like no charisma or mm -hmm. are shy or whatever it is or don't just never show any emotion. Uh, yeah, give me Toby Roberts. Mm. That was great. It can only end great, right? Like once you do that that fist pump to the crowd before you top, it's either going to end in a top and you look like a badass doing it, or you're going to take the dumbest fall of your life and we're all going to be laughing at you. And that's fun too, at least for all of us viewers. So it's like a win-win. Everybody should do that. The second you yeah. start feel, you start feeling pumped, just turn to the crowd and be like, you know what? I got to leave it all on the table. I think that's <laughs> awesome. I, I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I liked it a lot. So, uh, yeah. and so if this is a joke, yeah, good stuff. If it was serious, uh, I agree to agree to disagree. Kairos Climber is, you know, longtime fan of the show, so um, it's all good. Yeah, I think that worked out okay, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah I we loved covered it. everything. Thanks to everybody who wrote in. These were actually some awesome, awesome headlines. Winners, losers. Good really prompt, appreciate yeah. it to everybody. So thanks for thanks yeah. for giving us your thoughts. Proves not all of our viewers are bots. There's at least a couple of real people in there among uh, among those numbers. But yeah, um, let's call it there. Thanks very much for watching this episode. Of course, we'll be back next week for Brianne Son, hopefully with a guest this time. I know we've been lacking on the guests. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that at the end of the season. But then the World Championships is just around the corner. So let's see what Brianne Son has in store. Uh, again, if you like this, like, subscribe, donate at the Patreon, join the Discord to talk about comps, just not with John because he's too old for that. But we do have Jerry Moffat in the chat if he knows where he is. Uh, and yeah, We'll be back next week, so thanks very much, and we'll see you guys in the next one.